This is a production of Cornell University. We'll start out with uh, welcoming everybody and thanks again. Uh, you know, appreciate everybody's patience for a couple of weeks. We took off while I got to travel, which was which was nice. And we're back at it today and we'll be announcing whatever the rest of the schedule will be. We will not be on tomorrow. We have uh, education with our State Park Golf Project. Um, and then Monday is the walk and talk with the GCSA and Y out at East Aurora Country Club uh, out by Buffalo with uh, uh, Drew Thompson, Thad's uh, brother. So we'll get a chance to look at some of the renovations he's done out there and hang out with some Buffalonians and maybe even have some uh, beef on weck while I'm out there. Now, what I was out doing this morning was looking at the frost. I don't know if you got down that got that down there, Ben. We had 27 degrees at my house. This is what the bluegrass lawn in my backyard looked like uh, when I when I woke up this morning. So this was very alarming, um, but it sort of paled in comparison to the absolutely spectacular views you get along the northern Italian coast. I was fortunate not to be where the rain and floods were. I guess the F1 race was canceled this weekend, right, Carl? Yeah. So um, I was on the other coast uh, over by Cinque Terre or near Genoa and La Spezia. We had a lovely time wandering around. This is a, a fortress in Port Venere that actually served as a jail for Napoleon when he went around pillaging Europe for a period of time. So Carl? I wish I had more to say. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I got for now. I'm going to save my conversation with Ben and the weather in a minute. What do you got for decision support tools today? Yeah, so Frank, I think sometimes we're uh, we're not great at, at telling people all the things we do. And, and one of the things we've been doing for the last year and a half is, is updating our forecast website. Uh, and we talk a lot about it on this show. We, we point people to our resources, whether it's the uh, the dandelion timing early in the year, the growing degree day information, the disease forecasting models. Uh, but really the last year and a half, we've worked with the NRCC, the, the Northeast Regional Climate Center, updating this website, the look and feel, the user experience. Uh, and the whole idea is that these are decision support tools. They help you make better decisions. Uh, you get more information equals better decisions, but really the, the user experience of, of those is a big deal. And we wanna get you that information in a quick and easy to interpret way. Uh, so we've made a couple of changes here. The look and feel of the website has changed. Uh, the homepage, we've given you some options now to customize it. Um, so we know a lot of people have maybe one or two uh, data points or maps that they like to use on the website. Um, so on our homepage now, you can pick up to four maps, select those on the on the homepage, and it, it displays those right when you get there. So you don't have to click four different times to get to your different maps. Um, one of the changes we made was really spurred by the Smith Kearns dollar spot model, uh, right? We have our dollar spot model, which is which is based on leaf wetness, hourly leaf wetness. Um, but we used to display it as sort of these dots, uh, yellow for low or yellow for medium, red for high, green for low. Um, but we really like that line graph idea and, and the way you can see trends more with a line graph versus that dot system we used to have. Um, so we transitioned to that with, with all our, our disease models, uh, the anthracnose, brown patch, pythium. So now you can see the trends of those lines. You can also change the time scale, uh, which is one thing we really wanted to include. It used to just be sort of the three days prior and, and maybe a three-day forecast. Now you can go all the way back. So what I'm showing on the screen here is, uh, is our model actually had dollar spot risk uh, ticking up there in, in late April. Uh, we had a couple of warm days. Uh, not sure we saw any dollar spot, um, so maybe that that model isn't great at that time, but it's good to see that and maybe compare it to the Smith current. You can compare those two models now that they look the same. Um, so again, more information is going to help you make better decisions. Um, and now we're going to have some new tools. Uh, so we have this runoff risk tool that's now on the website. Um, we pulled this from uh, Michigan and, and Wisconsin have this for ag. So these big ag operations which store manure, they have to get rid of that manure in the, in the edges of the season. And they have this tool that uses soil saturation to tell them, hey, here's when it's low risk to, to apply that manure. You're not going to run off and create water quality issues. Uh, so we work with some folks at NOAA, the NRCC, and said, hey, could we, could we use this for turf and fertilizer applications, pesticide applications? And they said, yeah, I, I think we can use that. We tweaked it a little bit. Um, so now we can, we can have this for turf. You can forecast it out. So uh, if, you get, if we can see the map here, Frank, if we look at just today, Right, low risk for the whole state, not a surprise. We, we've been very low in, in soil moisture, or maybe even getting the drought in certain places. You look a day ahead, okay, maybe there's a little spot in the North Country that's gonna get some rain. 
And then, hey, on Saturday, it's, it's looking like maybe an inch at Oak Hill. Uh, we're going to get some widespread rain, I think, in the, the western New York, up in the north country. And you see that runoff risk go up, right? Uh, and I think one of the reasons we envision, one of the things we see, Frank, how, how people are going to use this tool is uh, you have your spray days, maybe it's Monday or Thursday or whatever, uh, being able to check a couple of days out, okay, my day's on Monday, hey, it's Friday, what is the runoff risk looking like? Okay, am I going to lose this application? Is, is it, does it have a moderate or high chance of running off? Hey, I need to communicate that with, with my GM, my membership, and hey, maybe we need to move things around a little bit to get the best efficacy, uh, and most importantly, to preserve water quality, right? We don't want this running off and into our water bodies. So using this tool... Uh, to sort of plan those applications. Uh, and then maybe the transition in, into some of the stuff with Ben today is the, is the growing season progress and how we're displaying that information. Um, so now we're sort of listing uh, growing degree days up at the top. You can see the forecast for the next couple of days. Might be important if you're looking at things like ABW, crabgrass prevention. Uh, but we've got this little bar here, this little tab, uh, show seasonal graphs. Uh, so this is really cool. This sort of contextualizes uh, the season uh, for those who can watch. The red line is this season. Uh, the black line is the sort of the 20-year normal. And the green line is last season. And you can see we're, we're actually at a pretty similar spot right around normal this year compared to last year compared to normal. But we've gotten there in really different ways. Um, for our location, we sort of accumulated a lot of growing degree days early in April. This is 50 growing degree day uh, uh, information. And then we were very stagnant for almost a month. Whereas last year we were very low below normal for a lot of, of the spring up until probably the second week in May until we really started accumulating growing degree days. So uh, I don't know if you look at something like this, Ben, and maybe it sort of uh, explains why we're seeing some weird ABW stuff, but um, you know, we're, we're at about the same growing degree day uh, number as we were last year in normal, but how we get there seems to really matter when you start looking at ABW migration. And, you know, Frank, we always talk about when is a growing degree day, a growing degree day. That's right. Maybe this stuff helps us explain some of that a little bit more. Yeah. And I got to tell you, Carl, it, it's it's that this big pause is is one of the big questions I, I got for you today, Ben. But I will say it was cold. It was a, a cooler than normal week that we just came out of that. Well, while I was away, I was here in 70 degrees. It was beautiful. Everything was good. I come back. It's 80 degrees when I land in JFK. And yesterday was like an October day. It didn't, war I don't think it got warmer than 45, 46 degrees. Uh, even though it was a beautiful sunshiny day, we've been on the cool side, but you do see along the coast, it's been warmer and that's been reflected in the soil temperatures, right? I asked Art this question this morning. I hadn't looked at the weather stuff yet. And you can see that the soils are warmer, obviously to the South, uh, into the high sixties, even out where you are, Ben, you may be pushing into the sixties. But we're still into the 40s, uh, into the 50s here uh, in central New York, which has got to have, you know, a big effect on a lot of the development of biological organisms. And it has been dry. Uh, it's been really dry this last couple of these, these last couple of 10, 12 days, uh, very little rainfall. And I think when you look at it, you can really see you're two inches behind uh, in this big wide swath cutting through the central part of the Northeast. And there is some rain coming. And unfortunately, Corcoran and the boys, all those Penn State boys you got up there, Ben, Corcoran and the boys are going to be squeegee and stuff if they, uh, if, they, if they get the kind of rainfall that they're talking about. It's going to soften that place up. And that, that can be a long, tricky golf course. And I know that rush is, that rush is lough. The, the, the rough is lush. Boy, I've been gone for too long. So this <laughs> rainfall is really going to kickstart a lot of things particularly as the heat starts to return, maybe by midweek we're hearing, we'll see a return uh, to normal conditions. So Ben, here's what I remember you saying this year. There's two things you talked about I've been following online. One is it looked like the adults were out early where you were. It's, you started to see them early. Uh, there was a lot of triggers early in this vein where you were looking. And then it started to spread up the valleys uh, you know, into the Pioneer Valley where UMass is and Olga is and up where we are. Uh, and so now everybody's got their adulticides out probably by now. Peak adults has probably passed in most places. But let's talk a little bit about what Carl uh, mentioned earlier. And let me go back to the slide because it's so great. How does this bottom graph here, this early surge of heat, 
It, what was your sense? Is that what drove these things going early? Because it wasn't everywhere that it happened like that. Yeah, I mean, I think what a great intro uh, hit on all the high points that I was thinking about, Carl. Well done there. Uh, and in fact, on my other screen, I have all our weather data pulled up. So I'm glad that you guys went so deep into that. And I've been furiously taking notes here. Uh, <laughs> it's really like we've had a couple of seasons in one. Uh, just for the first generation. So uh, here, re, you know, and, and very much stratified across the region too, where New York, uh, and we see this, it's almost like the Southern tier border. Uh, it's really like a different zone almost. And that played out very much so this year. Hmm. Um, we're getting down into the Southern zone, you know, Pennsylvania and along the coast. I thought that was a brilliant synopsis as well, as that's where we're seeing the greatest divide between the Eastern part of Pennsylvania uh, I was just at Wilmington Country Club on uh, Tuesday. Uh, it's a different world down there. They're they're moving along pretty fast. Um, it was a really, really fast start to the season. And, and that early movement we saw possibly February in some places in the south of Pennsylvania uh, and even into March in Pennsylvania. I'm not really too concerned about that. Um, I, I love that you guys focus on this stuff because Let's not make it harder than it is. These are yeah, amen to that. You know, right? These are organisms that are tightly cued into things like temperature. But you know, if you're an insect that's native to temperate North America, you're probably not only tied into temperature, but there are probably some other indicators like day length mm -hmm. that will tell you, hey, now's not a good time to come out because we have these fall springs. Uh, so it is a little bit like, am I eating crazy pills? Uh, you know, this is the same thing every year. And the big thing that I feel in my job is telling people not to freak out and not to spray these things so, so quickly um, in regards to the beginning of the year. Well, so it's, it's, well here's what I've noticed, Ben. I'll, I'll interrupt and say, mo I think people that have had a hit, places that have had a history with this problem would rather be early than late they i i wish more people scouted um because even i will say and it's not a knock on greencast greencast was saying you know this and that and then we people were saying i got tons of weevils and then i called carlone he can't find any on long island he, he's right. got none in the rough so it also um, is very site specific right Without a doubt, and I'll go out on a limb, and I think way too many people sprayed way too early because I will say that that first application uh, through much of the region, again, this is child's play. This is simple stuff. Let's not make it harder than it is. And even if you didn't do anything other than look at plant phenological indicators, you would have been fine. Yeah. And yet what we're seeing is those first two applications in the green cast, so that would be a delta side. The second one I'm not too concerned about because it's the acelaprin spray, and they would say it's really for white grubs. So my thinking is, you know, why would that be in the weevil track anyway? I think it's yeah. a great service. Yeah, yeah. It's the number one monitoring tool that people Well, and your blog posts are great. All of you guys that contribute to the blog things there are just really informative. And and to, to second your note, you don't have to make it that complicated. A lot of you guys are doing a lot of this stuff, saying now's the time to go look, find some spots, make up a soapy yeah. solution. This isn't rocket science. It's a little bit of soapy water. Pour it on, go change the cups, come back and take a look and see how many you got. Now, in the past, Ben, I know I had you on the podcast a long time ago when Beth Page with their pyrethroid resistance had moved to a primarily large side program. And I know you were saying at the time, this was a sort of a sexy thing to do and, and could be risky. But now I feel like everybody's tune about this has changed a little bit, that maybe larvicides are becoming more of the focus of some of these sprays. What say you about those that missed the adulticide or didn't use the adulticide to get an effective larvicide treatment? Because I bet you Urbanski at Wilmington's already made it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think this is where you're so New York centric, both in that comment and both yeah. where you are in the season. You guys are so far behind. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot of pressure on guys like Rod Ferentino to move his sights along. But Rod's saying like, no, we're not ready there. And I think some triggers were pulled early and Rod was pretty much overridden on these things. So that's the inside baseball. Ah. Uh, I will say this. The first two applications came really fast and people are waiting. Like now that we've had one and two. 
let's pull three. And I've had to push back on that, say, we're not seeing that in Ohio. We're not seeing that in Pittsburgh. State College in Pittsburgh are probably closer than I've ever seen them before. Uh -huh. Harrisburg, my far eastern site, is probably the furthest along. And if you go east of Harrisburg, it's like night and day. So okay. like that, that overview of what's happening on the coast is is dead on uh correct so, so are we at bigger risk how how worried are you now still about a larvicide only program uh a little bit concerned i think this might be a year in some places where you could get away with it one i think you got to look back to what happened last year severe drought i think populations in general are very very low uh, I think everywhere outside of New York, we've got some new products that have been making a big impact. There's more of them so we can rotate a little bit better. Uh, it's really kind of moving into minor pest status in my world. Whoa. To be honest, on the properties where I'm at, uh, they are pretty much non-existent to low uh, unless you you really kind of, you know, haven't paid attention or got antsy. I, 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 I primarily feel, and I, in my heart of hearts, Frank, I pray for a wet, hot spring. I need destruction. I, I, <laughs> I really, I, and we've got a lot of projects going with ABW on them that are, my graduate students are doing that are really fascinating, but it's like, uh, I think we're in kind of a glory period of great products, flexible products. Now, New York, totally different animal. So what wow. don't we have here? You, what, We have ferrets, and I hear guys uh, yeah. singing the praise of ferrets. That seems to be a real go-to product for a lot of guys that have moved into this uh, larvicide approach. Yeah, I think uh, ferrets is, is definitely a top, top product. It's something that I would have on hand. Uh, everywhere else has Soprata, which is a new product. It's okay. an insect growth regulator. Uh, so we've looked at it over many years. Super flexible as far as timing, whether... Uh, I it's really affects the insect as it goes to molt. So it should be mm. a larvicide. But when we put it down anywhere between adult peak into uh, this time of the year in Pennsylvania, rhododendron full bloom, mm -hmm. it's really dynamite as far as uh, control. So really flexible. So it's hard to screw up. So I think right. that also plays well in our world, because what I see is we use these regional monitoring tools and we look at the south and see what our peers are doing in transition zone and then my people are always like hey is it time to spray and it's like no just wait wait um so ferrets is fairly flexible uh soprano is even more flexible so you think we're going to get it is there you think there's an obstacle to new york labeling it or is it just really just a matter of getting the package together and getting it submitted because i got to believe they're going to make some money on that product in new york yeah i mean we hear um Rum, grumblings of uh, whether it's going to go through or not. I don't foresee it uh, being much of an issue. It's different from our traditional neurotoxins. So, uh, you know, humans, mammals don't have a chitinous exoskeleton. So when the insect goes to molt, uh, if it's come in contact through um, ingestion or, or contact with the, the cuticle, it basically weakens their cuticle. So it's going to take some time for that insect to die. But, um, you know, I, I don't know I think the B data looks better than mm -hmm. most neurotoxins. Uh, the low mammalian uh, really? toxicity looks good. I really so don't know what the holdup is. So it's a growth regular, like what, Merit? In no, that it would be class? more like um, the one that you might be familiar with would be Mach 2 halophenicide. Yeah, halophenicide. Um, so that was like the late 1990s, yeah, yeah. and that went up against Merit, which was yeah. less selective against the other white grub species. So Mach 2 halophenicide was really good. Um, you know, it could be considered bioirrational in my mind, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but it was just, it seemed to hit some species and not others. So, so, so speaking of bioirrational, um, Civitas comes up, you published a paper on it, just a note about using it uh, as a strategy incorporating with your other chemistry. I, I don't think it's something you're going to rely on alone, um, but it probably is something that is, could be a component, a good component of your sprays. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we've got several projects going um, right now, and in, in, uh, I have one of my graduate students looking at uh, synergists of pyrethroids. Mm -hmm. I think that there is something there. Mm -hmm. 
uh, with the Civitas. We've seen great activity with Civitas in the greenhouse trials and laboratory trials. If we can, you know, basically coat the insect with it or get it into their body, it seems to bang them up. Yep. It's just really hard to do those studies with adults in the field when they yep. wander quite a bit. Yep. So you got to hit them, right? It's got to yeah, land. Right. And it doesn't really lend itself to doing the small plot research trials that we, you and I do, Frank. That's so, right. um, you know, if you hit it, it might move into the other plot. Yeah. You know, it might yeah. drop eggs. Yeah. Uh, so unless we were doing like wide swaths, which is more anecdotal than scientific, um, yeah. that's going to be really hard to show. But we feel quite confident with that. Um, oils are good. Just a, you could spend a lifetime, a career on looking at oils and their yeah. effects on insects. Yeah. Uh, we've kind of moved more into looking at uh, pyrethroid synergists with uh, wetting agents. Uh, ah. So one of my graduate students is finishing that up, and we basically took a, a a full class approach. You know, I write to my colleague Mike Bedanza and say, you know, he had published this. These are the yeah. different classes that we yeah. have in turf grass, and we just screened every class, and we have identified like several classes that have a synergistic effect against resistant insects. Well, this is uh, good because they're using wetting agents anyway. Right. And so what we think is we're pretty close to it. We looked at whether it suppresses the enzymes that are responsible, and it doesn't seem to be the case. So I think it's just delivering a higher amount of that toxin into the insect. Mm -hmm. uh, so By reducing you know, the surface tension. Yeah, basically, you know, that's how you got to get these toxins past this waxy cuticle that the insect has that's naturally repellent. Right. So it might so be doing that. So let me wrap up the annual bluegrass weevil yeah. stuff. Uh, I got one more big topic to chat with you about, but um, Red Sox Yankees. I noticed no, that you, I don't you, want, can, no, you, well. you canceled on me on the week that we flipped over you guys. So I know, I, I know. Like, oh. And what is it? The world isn't right when the Red Sox and the Yanks are in last place. But here's what I can tell you. I was told a long time ago by some smart people, yeah, put bentgrass in, annual bluegrass doesn't eat, annual bluegrass weevil doesn't eat bentgrass, and now I'm hearing more and more reports that it's pretty, doing pretty well on bentgrass, and they can be, I always, I mean, the paper I read was they don't reproduce as effectively, right, the fecundity is down. Where is the thinking among you entomologists on how this organism might transition to becoming the uh, creeping bentgrass weevil? Yeah, so that's uh, that's another one of my PhD students, Audrey Samard. She's been working on a USGA funded project looking at why is bentgrass so tolerant? Um, I don't know if it's really reduced fecundity. Uh, I think they'll lay as many eggs. It's just something with the larvae that they don't seem to develop as well. Mm -hmm. So what she's been looking at, phytohormones, uh, the response that the plant makes, kind of looking at the differences between annual bluegrass and creeping bentgrass. How do those two things differ? And so we looked at the big phytohormones, you know, salicylic acid and jasmonic acid. Uh, and it looks like, you know, so jasmonic acid is what we typically think in the entomology world as being elicited in response to chewing insects, where salicylic acid might be a pathogen or a piercing sucking insect. And our thinking was, you know, this is a stem borer, so it's probably fooling the plant to overcome this. And what we see is, uh, you know, nobody's really looked at this with insects, um, you know, the defense responses other than like endophytes. So this is pretty novel work. And it looks like creeping bent grass just starts at a higher level of uh, jasmonic acid, what we would expect to be naturally resistant to the insect. So she's looking at field studies of applying uh, these different things. The interesting thing about POA is it has a lot of salicylic acid. Yeah. So, but, you know, it's not something that we think of being as overly disease resistant. No. You know, it gets hammered. So uh, that's an interesting one there. So um, you're not seeing when you have a. It, OK, let me just be if for Bansky. Let's use John as an example at Wilmington. He, he's probably got bentgrass and bluegrass, uh, you know, Kentucky bluegrass or tall fescue and creeping yeah. bentgrass everywhere. Right. Does he have weevil problems on his bentgrass? Does he have to spray like he's got annual bluegrass? I mean, is yeah, this I mean, as I, big of a deal? I, I think you would see specs. I mean, I, you do see annual bluegrass here and there. Yeah. And maybe the insect prefers those little uh, areas. But I think that's also once you move into that environment and you're having less and less annual bluegrass. So you're going to be forced to eat on, you know, something. And it will. And it will. 
and it and definitely it will. And, uh, you know, I can say that I was at a pretty big facility in Ohio um, this spring who tried to use it as POA reduction. And, uh, you know, they <laughs> I don't recommend that, do you? You don't recommend I, that. I definitely do not. Um, it's interesting. My old lab at Rutgers has been promoting that for years. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I, I think it's just uh, they will, you know, adapt. So okay. that's the, you know, the other yeah. thing that Audrey's working at is, you know, what's going to happen as this insect moves south? Will it develop in, and we've challenged, uh, you know, perennial rye and zoysia yeah. and, and oh. uh, huh. Bermuda grass. So we're, we're trying to characterize the nutritional contents oh, of all great. of those plants as well to see uh, will they develop. So that's really important work, Ben. I mean, we've yeah, been, no, I think uh, Audrey's got a lot. It's just these data sets are massive. I think that's the only problem that we have. Well, and I would say the data set's going to get even more massive because it looks like the spread of this organism, annual bluegrass weevil range is spreading as the climates are changing. Uh, but I cannot, listen, we only got a few more minutes and I wanted to spend more time on worms because you created a little kerfuffle uh, on, the, on Twitter a while ago where you were saying sand top dressing was actually leading to increasing worm populations on putting greens, if I recall. Do I have Absolutely. it right? Absolutely. Uh, well, I mean, we do uh, our research on fairways, uh, research oh, fairways. fairways. So, okay. yeah, I mean, we, that's pretty, uh, I feel pretty confident in that. And, uh, you know, Paige so, Boyle saw it with her Southern earthworms as well. So doesn't that contradict the work in the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, I mean, I think you could look at several studies that contradict that. So I don't think we're the first to to really show that. So what um, are your thoughts here? What's what's going on? Yeah, so uh, you know, you get like you probably get these uh, papers that come through your email, uh, and you know, you have different alerts for things. And this earthworm paper came through my email uh, that kind of explained it. I thought it was kind of an aha moment because. We always thought that putting down sand uh, led to increases. We'd see increases for, you know, one to two weeks after casting. If we looked at it the way a pathologist looks at area under the curve, mm -hmm. it was significant increases year after year. We conducted it in the same plots for over a three-year period. Really, COVID shut that one down. Uh, but, you know, we had pretty much seen that by then. Uh, I thought it just irritated them. I thought uh, it diluted their food so that they would have to consume more soil to get that organic matter out of the soil uh, and therefore we're casting more. And this paper that came through my inbox was like um, pretty good evidence for some related species uh, that sand in that grit actually enhances the digestibility Case. of the material. So you're talking about a different species? Uh, yeah, I mean, lumber kids, so they would be within the same group, you know, in, in Europe and they were basically looking at where they were uh, and then doing these uh, mesocosm experiments, yep. experiments where they had different uh, soil types. Yep, yep, and yep. increasing that sand content in the soil led to more casting as it allowed them to digest. A Could bit. it be related? Okay, here's what I know from the work out west. They use cheap mason sand that's really angular because it's oftentimes used to make concrete, right? And I'm wondering if sand shape is part of what might be going on for as an irritant, because you just mentioned food source. Obviously, you know, you get a fair amount of organic matter in sand. It does dilute it, but the plants can be happy if you give them enough water and nutrients. And there's a lot of macropores for them to explore. It is a diluted amount of organic matter, but it, it's still organic matter. And I'm wondering if angularity of sand matters. Yeah, I mean, we can see it on the extreme end. Chris Williamson did that work at Wisconsin years yep. ago where he looked at coal slag, and that's super, super <laughs> jagged, and it did lead to reductions. I, I kind of wonder, one, sourcing how you'd get that to every place, and then two, do you really want to have a whole bunch of broken glass in your yeah. profile? <laughs> okay, um, all right. So, so what are you recommending? Oh, thiophanate methyl for okay. dollar spot. That's what I recommend. Right <laughs> well, dry. we're going to get Let restricted, right? I mean, we I got mean a if you got dollar money. spot, go out there with thiophanate methyl. Uh, well, I mean, it's really tough. Um, 
you know, we had a project last year where we were electroshocking them from the soil. Um, you know, that company is a small startup, and I'm sure you've had many projects like that. Well, we got like, Led Zeppelin. We play, we play Stairway to Heaven. Oh, that's right. That's soil, right. right. Yeah, the acoustic thing. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I, you know, I like that idea. Uh, unfortunately, with like a lot of these startups that come to you, you know, it's like they might disappear the next year. So I, I got to revisit with them, maybe get out to Washington State. And, and we do see that it, uh, you know, ha we kind of proved the theory, but we need to do trials with that to really. So the Saponins, as far as you know, are off the table. We're not going to see them back on the market anytime soon. Oh, uh, there are still saponins on the market um there there's one product that's still available and i don't How do you like it what, uh yeah i mean they're effective uh you need to have sequential applications uh, they definitely do a job they're expensive uh you need a pretty good rate per acre mm, yeah. but yeah they're definitely effective i do think like the 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 key and you know i'm trying to figure out how I can get to Ireland in September to do this study. But I, I really do think it's a survey of the soils. I think the next generation, much smarter people than I am, you know, the people I train uh, and push around money for and don't get to do the research. I think that the solutions in the soil, these organisms require, a, you know, a symbiont, basically bacterial partners to help them digest. So do we want to go that route and nuke everything in the soil just to get rid of earthworms? It might be playing God a little too much, but I, I think it's really kind of the approach that I would like to take and that I'm proposing is really kind of like what they've done with MLSN and doing paired sampling of these abrupt changes, and you will probably see that if you walk enough turf or you have casting and it immediately stops in the That's same right. type That's right. of, uh, you know, area. Like fairway. Yeah, you definitely, I, I can tell you, you see pockets of these things and yeah. it's not always explained. And I get the time, I get some time out at Laurel Town uh, Golf Club out in Eugene, Oregon with Will, right? Will Benson. Oh yeah, Will Benson's the best. Yeah, Will Benson. And 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 uh, he has a really interesting... We... He, yeah, I mean he's he's great, and, and we've talked a little. We played Winter Park Nine down in Orlando. Uh, oh, good uh, for GIS. Will's awesome, and yeah. uh, you know he. We had talked uh, some molasses stuff, so he, he's into the alternative yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to break his heart about the molasses with yeah. <laughs> leather jacket. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so last thing, then we'll we'll wrap it up, Carl. Uh, thiophanate methyl, Ben. There's talk of it being restricted. Uh, I've heard. I've heard. Yeah, it. and it's you know. I've heard some people say, yeah, don't worry about it. You know, it's a good summer patch product. You might only have to use it once, but a lot of us know we use it for other reasons. Um, many guys are making multiple applications of this. We, we are likely to have restrictions that could be an impact, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we, we really need to kind of move away from those things. And mm -hmm. fortunately there's not a whole lot of people who work on these things. Um, yeah. uh, you know, and I do think the solution is probably in the soil. That being said, I think there's a lot of like companies that are claiming things uh, that aren't exactly true yeah, based on be careful about what that. we see as far as nutritional products, because um, if you're feeding the soil, it shouldn't have a deleterious effect on earthworms, number one. So yeah. I'd be very skeptical of those products. But, um, you know, we've been looking at kind of it doesn't reduce them, but it can ameliorate the conditions of the casting, like things like, um, you know, I, we recommend punching a solid tine in the fairway, just give them a cylinder to shit in, basically. So, oh, you know, like that seemed to be highly effective through the winter time. Uh, we got great pictures of that. It looks like this rich casting material in the in the channel. You don't need to pull the plug uh, and clean that up. So, you know, maybe we've looked at scarifying that doesn't seem to have a big effect. I think they're too sensitive to vibrations. You would have to really chop them in the act. So, uh, you know, it's not a great solution, but it, it, it can help with the smearing a little bit. Uh, but you know, how many times can you get out there? In well, the we got, you know, they... we got, uh, we got one golf course superintendent, Steve Curta at Tuscarora, really solid guy, president of our GCSA yep. and why um, he's created a window uh, of uh, play. Uh, what is it, Carl, in the 10 to 10 30 range or something? I think he's got, I think he's got an hour of block tee times right after one of their leagues. So it's usually slower play. So what, what he's done, I think it's around 10 to 11. 
he's saying, hey, we're going to go mow dry. We're going to drag it, drag the clip, drag the uh, the castings, and then go mow it dry. And that's basically the solution he's looking to try. And, and I love it. I think that's a, that's a great idea. I think, you know, my dad's an engineer. I, I have him trying to build different brushes and stuff for weevils, <laughs> for weevil removal and stuff like that. And uh, you know, I have an idea, but I don't know if it's mechanically possible. But ben, uh, you know, thank, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Listen, Carl, we're way past. You got a great <laughs> question, or should we let him go? No, no. I wanted to hear the electrification stuff, so I think we got through that. All right, good. Yeah. Ben, <laughs> thanks so much for taking yeah. the time. It's always great awesome. to see you, pal. Yeah, awesome to see you guys. I, I love your maps. I, I wrote down all these notes here about. Ah, uh, great. Yeah, uh, they're yours. They're always yours. Awesome. Yep. Appreciate awesome. it. Carl, great seeing you again. I guess we're off for a little bit. We'll get back with everybody on the Monday shortcut email, right? Yeah, and then uh, I think we'll do a couple more shows, Frank. So we're going to hey. extend. I think this was supposed to be our end date, but you know we missed a couple, so uh, we'll, we'll give you some more extra credit shows. Okay. At the very least next week, and then and hopefully a couple after. So uh, for now, take care, everybody. Uh, enjoy. Yep. We'll see you next week. Thanks a lot, Ben. Awesome. Thanks, Carl. Guys. Thanks, Ben. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.